This is one of the most significant parchments in map making. A map that in a single breath had the power to change the history books. This map told us that Christopher Columbus didn't discover the new world in sailing across the Atlantic in the late 15th century, and in fact, the discovery was made by the Vikings some 500 years before. But it was a forgery, a forgery so well executed that it fooled the world for 60 years. This is the story of the map that was a hoax, and yet it turned out its narrative was entirely right all along. It's autumn 1957 and Lawrence Witten II is browsing a bookstore in Geneva. Lawrence, a dealer himself from New Haven, Connecticut, is on a regular trip to Europe to stock up with some book treasures to take back home. He made this trip many times, but this trip would be different and would set the wheels in motion for a story that would last over half a century. As normal, Lawrence scoured the dusty shelves ran his fingers across the books and all of a sudden he came across a relatively modern casing. Curious to see what was inside, he opened it up. His heart began to race as he realised the significance of what he could be looking at. A map on vellum implying that North America had been discovered by Norse travellers some 500 years before the era of Columbus. In 1957 there was no evidence of such Viking voyages, just tales laid in folklore and legend. But this map, this could change everything. It showed what would be the earliest European document with any part of the New World on. Could this map truly be genuine because it would mean rewriting the history books? Or perhaps it was a forgery, an extremely elaborate one at that. And if it was fake, who was responsible and why? Six years prior, Witten had set up his bookshop. 1951 was a great time for this niche, medieval and renaissance manuscripts. Maps were being sold off in Europe at a profitable price for him to move on in the States. Now, one of Witten's contacts in Europe was a man named Nicholas Rauch, a real fixer in the world of book and manuscript dealings. You see, 1950s Europe had a lot of restrictions in a lot of different areas, but Rauch, he was your man. One of Rauch's suppliers was Enzo Farajoli de Rai, an Italian who himself travelled Europe as a dealer and brought many items to Rauch's attention. We would later discover one of these was indeed the map. There was something else with this that would play a key role, even as close as 2021, the Tartar Relation, another manuscript which was an account of a journey by two Polish clerics in the lands of Genghis Khan mid-1200 AD. There was another curious feature of this map, that of the small wormholes. Now at this point it didn't really take up too much of Witten's mind and time, because if this map was genuine, well it would highlight two things. Number one, European knowledge of Norse sailings to North America quite some time before Columbus. And secondly, that the discovery of Vinland took place between 985 and 1001 AD, because this map came with an inscription. Now Witten was nervous, rightly so, but everything started to come together at this point, because if this was a forgery, it would take a team of highly skilled people to get everything right. The paper, the ink, the general look of the whole thing. This really was adding up to being what it was. The map 
took shape undoubtedly from other medieval maps of a similar date, north on top and three main continents surrounded by the oceans. The detail was low with just five cities on it, but now we have more than those other medieval maps. We now have a new discovery, almost certainly born out of new explorations, new journeys and new adventures. Witten noted that we now have a depiction of Greenland with quite some detail, and we also have Vinland. Witten had doubts, but still he purchased a map for $3,500. Two weeks on and Witten arrives home with a map. Witten was very discreet about the map. He didn't want to be ridiculed, although it was a strong gut instinct and a whim purchase, he could be wrong. He took it to a friend at Yale and both of them noticed some wording on the rear. Delineation of the first part, the second part and the third part of the speculum. This puzzled them both and for good reason because it would turn out to perhaps play a part in the riddle that would solve everything. Three years on and Wynne had done very little with the map aside, gift it to his wife. The very real possibility that this could be the discovery of a lifetime was almost too much for Witten and his, his reputation should it fall flat. What Witten was about to discover soon shook him to the core though. Witten learnt he had not discovered this map at all. In fact, two of the world leading cartographers themselves had also had the opportunity to examine this map. R.A. Skelton and George Painter of the British Museum, between them, years of experience in medieval cartography. Painter was quoted later as describing this as A major and authentic message from the Middle Ages. An American discovery, a true voice from the past that still lives and never needs to be silent again. But at the time though, Skelton, who too was convinced of the authenticity, had concerns. He needed to be 100% sure of this and he needed to guarantee all of this before his reputation was hung on the line. There would never be a guarantee of provenance and why would there be? So Skelton, he refused to take it any further. Meanwhile, Witten receives a phone call from Tom Marston, who insists he comes over straight away because he has some new manuscripts for Witten to have a look at. Now, they are friends, they know each other well, and I think often Witten recalled Marston as suggesting that he would often gloat about the things he'd found, but as with every other time, well, Witten couldn't refuse, so he did just that. One specific manuscript had caught Tom's eye. It was part of the Speculum Historial, a history of the world written by a Dominican friar Vincent de Beauvais. They estimated it was from the 15th century. Witten himself, though, at first thought it might just give some useful parallels to the Vinland map and the Tartar relation. He hadn't seen the word speculum before, had he? He had indeed. Now Witten agreed with Marston that he would borrow the document for a few days. But almost as soon as he got home, everything started to piece together almost too quickly. You see, everything was the same. The size and the dimensions were the same as the map and the Tata relation. And of course, there was something else he'd seen before, a watermark, a bull's head or an ox's head. And if that wasn't enough for you, there's something else that linked all of these three documents together. Well, they all shared the same wormholes in the same place. They all aligned and they all matched up. They'd all been in the same binding. Witten was now convinced that forgery was close to impossible with this much detail. In his mind, it was probably that Enzo Ferrajoli had obtained these all at the same time, but had no clue that they were all from the same binding. He sold them all separately. Witten and Marston started to make some noise about this, but it wasn't easy. A wealthy philanthropist, Paul Mellon, though, was extremely keen, and he wanted testing to be done further on these documents. He offered Mrs. Witten $300,000 for the entire works, which were now all in her possession. She gratefully accepted. 
the race was now back on and once again included Painter and Skelton from the British Museum, plus an entire group of specialists, cartographers, ink and binding experts, map curators. And after a few years, they all concluded that the map was 100% genuine. Now they all drew up their own lengthy documents to support their own personal claims. And of course, in doing so, they put their own reputation on the line. Ninth of October 1965, the map, the manuscripts were now public knowledge. A 300 page document with supporting evidence was provided by Yale University and the map now stood on show for all to see. I had no idea where the map came from, beyond Ferragioli. It seemed that all the Italians and Latin Americans were incensed that anyone would dare to assail the priority of Columbus's discovery of the New World. In fact, the insult was compounded by the fact that the Yale announcement fell just before Columbus Day. But the work had been done, the supporting documents from each individual. If you wanted to disprove this, you'd have your work cut out. That didn't stop people trying. And come 1966, well, a conference it was set up all about this map. And nothing really changed for almost a decade. 1974 and a research company, Macrone Associates, were allowed to use advanced technology to analyse the ink. And they did so with devastating consequences. Essentially, they found titanium dioxide within the ink. This was only commercially available from the 1920s. The university tentatively admitted that this may now be a forgery. Time would be a healer though. 1985 when we have the Crocker Nuclear Lab at the University of California. And the university analyzed these findings of the Macron Associates and found that only minute traces of titanium dioxide were present. In fact, the Gutenberg Bible contained more of this element than the Vinland map itself. Not least this, but the ink contained a lot of earlier trace elements missed by the original analysis, more akin to medieval inks. Here we are now back in the mid 1980s. And of course the map is back in play, but time continues to pass and we continue to have scores of people trying from various uh, academic areas to try and discredit this map. The insurance value of the works is now $20 million. For the next 30 years, we would see countless swayings back and forth. It's fake, it's real, it's fake. It's a work of art. Regardless though, today, today we have a different story. 2021. Yale University now have access to countless new techniques, non-destructive techniques and tests and analysis and they're able to test the constituent parts of things like the ink once again. In fact, they can do the same on countless other medieval manuscripts from the reputed same era. Now the Tartar relation and the Speculum Historial do indeed match, but the map, no. You see, the results once again prove that titanium dioxide is present everywhere on the map. It's only when you look at the inscription though that we find the key to why this was deliberate. The first part of the inscription stands, it contains those early medieval ink traces, but the latter part, well, none of those elements appear and it's only the titanium dioxide. And what's more, it shows that the forgery covered all of the writing as if to make it seem like the original instruction for the binding. In other words, all three. You can really see why Witten and his colleagues were fooled, all staking their reputation on this map. It remains today in Yale University because it has given us a history in its own right. But the final twist in this tale of this map that perhaps aimed to remove the notion that Columbus found the Americas came in the 1960s, just a few years on, Newfoundland Meadow Cove. A team of archaeologists over a period of around seven years excavated a set of old mounds that the locals referred to as Old Indian Camp. The finds were indeed staggering and perhaps pales the map story into insignificance because the buildings and the dwellings were indeed Norse. 
they remain today as the only Norse settlement in North America outside of Greenland. The map was fake, but it seems the story was not. Thanks for watching this little production, a little bit different to normal. If you like it, then of course we'll do some more. And uh, of course, if you want behind the scenes, you can sign up to our Patreon and our YouTube members using all the good links in the description below. We'll see you in the next production.